Okay, welcome back to the blasted bike, everybody. My bearings have finally shown up. They're actually a couple days early, which is nice. Um, I also found my tripod, and I remember now how busted it is. So my video should be a little better now that I have a tripod. You know, nothing a little duct tape can't fix. I'm going to go ahead and replace all these bearings. Um, if you guys remember, this there's a little bit of travel in most in these two specifically. This one, the one that I purchased in the kit, seems to have almost as much, if not more, play than the one that's already in here. So I'm almost thinking I'm going to leave that guy alone. Um, we'll see though. Because, like I said, the ones I got, they're a little bit cut rate, and I'm not going to complain because it took over a week to get here, so I just want to get them in. Um, my mains, I'm going to go ahead with the Kalama set of mains because they look better than the Chinese set of mains, so all right without further ado we're gonna go ahead and tear into this first things first I'm gonna pluck those bad seals out I can't claim that all my bearings are gonna be the best quality but these ones this is in the Kalama set they're actually made in Japan just like the originals so that's nice to know I actually didn't know that it's claimed that the manufacturer region was Taiwan but this says Japan so that's cool <laughs> At least some of the bike will be decent. So if you already found yourself with one of these bearing puller tools, you don't necessarily need the seal puller, because I found that the largest one that came with mine, which uh, of course they don't label it because it's the cheapest bearing tool that you can get, but this was the largest one in my set. This fit right into the stator seal, and I just went ahead and did the exact same thing you would do if it was a blind bearing. Just pluck, you know. Bang, 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 and out she came. I was having a little bit of a hard time with little dinky winky here because aluminum is in itself a pretty good heat sink. I mean, they use it for radiators and heat sinks all the time and computers. So I went ahead and just, you know, you know just ignore that propane weed torch over there. <laughs> I was gonna run out of gas in the little tank before I ever even got one bearing out. So anyway, and I don't think it hurt anything. Now, earlier I said I wasn't going to clean this. I am going to clean up these surfaces, though, because, you know, you, let's be honest, that, that looks like crap. And you want this seal to do a good job, so we will clean this. I was just, when I was saying I wasn't going to clean it, clean it, I meant areas that don't really matter, like, you know, these walls. Like, there's still a little bit of oil film there. I'm not going to worry about that. And I probably won't worry about this. I might spray a little bit of some kind of solvent on it, but I'm not going to get crazy. The only things I really want clean are these surfaces here that the seals go into. And, you know, while we're there. Yep. Got it. First one replaced of many. Hopefully they all go well. That one had me a little scared at first because as the case was cooling down, she wasn't going in, but, you know, few minutes went by and the case shrank down to about the right size and it took it. Alrighty, all three are spinning. And we got our seals in too. Our seals all around. Minus the clutch one because it's actually in really good shape so I didn't bother with that. And now we're going to go ahead heat on the other side. Boy, I heated this side up and they all just fell out. I didn't even really have to do much. I got real lucky on this side. All it took was that one blast of heat and they all fell out. And then, I didn't even have to tap them in, I just pressed them in with my hands. So, there was actually enough heat here to press every single one by hand in. I never had to return to the torch, so, you know, there's lucky and then there's that. <laughs> okay. Got the crank in. I just went ahead and sweat it in. Should be good. And of course the other one doesn't want to just nicely. There we go. Yeah. Nice. Come on. Oh yeah, you can definitely tell that is much better than what it was. That was definitely a problem. 
feels so much nicer. All right, so here's the number two shift fork. I have it with the two that is casted on the on the fork facing this way. Um, here's a little bit of it in action. So it's in between these two gears here, the sliding gear rack. Let me go ahead and remove it so you guys can kind of see. So you just want it in between those two gears. Got a bunch of oil all over the place, so you know, that counts as assembly lube, right? <laughs> Try to get this dowel to sit back down again. So there you go, that's where that's going. Okay, the other two shift forks, the number one and the number three. And again, both those numbers are going to face that way. Number one just fits back here. It's pretty idiot proof actually, and you can kind of lift up and down on the gear and see that it works. Number three goes right here, moves that body. These two will align together. And that dowel will go right through. I'm also going to go ahead and lube them up. But I figured before I do that, I would show you guys kind of where they go. So there's number three. And just two gears over is number one back there. All right, we've just gone ahead and installed our shift drum. And now we can go ahead and rotate it and see if we have a full range of motion throughout the transmission. It would appear that... Yep, there we go. It would appear that we do have a full range of motion. Which appears to be operating. Yep. Everything's moving. Cool, cool. This part's going to take a little while. I got to fidget with everything up here. I've got the underside here buttered up with the Yama Lube. And we're just going to walk it down and then I'm going to get my crank tool back out and use it to walk it the rest of the way down. I'm going to, I just want to go easy with it. force on this. Seems to be going down pretty even. Yeah, it's going down. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so the gasket mashed out in spots. The sealant, that is. Which is a good sign. It means that it made contact. It may be a little sloppy, but it'll work. We're all together. She spins. Yep. Feels alright. So, on to the next thing. Alright, so now we're finally getting to stuff that I actually like to do. Got my hardware package here laid out. Crisscross pattern. 7.2 foot pounds of torque. If anyone is interested, of course, that's almost a joke on one of these older wrenches. Like you barely move the dang thing and click. <laughs> so I'm just going to go ahead and do that real quick. Going ahead and getting those bearing retainers back on. Got a little bit of thread locker for the occasion. Keep them where they belong. Got one more to go. I'm going to go ahead and get the stator plate in next. Now, I made a little teeny tiny nick in the case to line up with this nick but there really isn't much motion for this thing to be changed timing wise so it's almost pointless but I went ahead and did it anyway I know on my Zundap there actually is quite a bit of motion between here and here they're actually slotted for a variable adjustment this one though as you can see it really doesn't have much these guys will go in and uh, 5.8 pounds of torque Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get this flywheel on. Got the Woodruff key already there. It's been there waiting all this time. We're just gonna slide the flywheel down, 
Get those two to meet the shaft notch and the woodruff key, that is. And then when we take the spacer and nut, and these guys here, 53 foot, por uh, foot pounds of torque is what we're going to put on that. So, and that fit in really nice. So now all I got to do is just torque her down a little bit, and then we'll be golden. I'm going to go ahead and do the stopper now. And uh, you want to do it as an assembly. And one thing you really want to pay attention to is the flare on the bolt there. It's supposed to fit into that arm. So you want to pay attention to that because if it comes out while you're fiddling with this spring, and you you got to work them kind of together while you're fiddling with the spring in this area, if that comes out, then it may look like it's in position, but it's not. And if you go ahead and test on it by taking a screwdriver and doing this, you'll notice that this guy will start turning out, which means it's not right. So I'm going to go ahead and get started on this. Like I said, we'll do it as an assembly. And I'll just uh, I'll be right back here in a second when we get a little further. Okay, so like I was saying, you want to work the bolt down. And as you work it down slowly, you can use the screwdriver to bend the arm, get it into its positioning there on the shift drum. And using the same screwdriver or a different one, whatever, you can also go ahead and apply force to the other side of the spring and get it to start walking down the case. Case has a slight taper there, I'll show you here. There's a slight taper to that case and that's going to help you walk that spring part into position. It's kind of difficult to film and do at the same time, so I'm just going to go ahead and do it. There are a lot of phrases and words to describe the process of doing this shift arm. It's not really all that difficult, but uh, fun is not one of the words I would use. So there you go, it's functioning. And you can tell it's functioning correctly because that's staying put. If you did it the wrong way, this will start to turn out every time you do this number. And that's no good. So, 10 pounds on that guy, thread lockered in. You have to kind of walk them back and forth together. You may need a couple of these too. Time to get this guy back in. Greased it up. This spring right here is going to align with a part on the case there, and I'll show you in a second. And the rest will align with that star wheel. Let's go ahead and drop some tools on the floor and make a mess with my non-professional workspace. And uh, Yeah, sounds good to me. Oh yeah, just add a little grease, they said. Oh my goodness. Of course that grease I added is going to get all over the place. Alright, so we're going to go ahead and align that spring with that shaft, which will allow those two shift hooks there to align with the star wheel, and they do. And that's pretty much together. Okay, this guy, the Kickstarter, fits in the groove up here, and this spring will fit in the groove down here. It's pretty easy. A lot of these spring-loaded deals can be a real pain, but luckily this one's not that bad. This is actually pretty mild spring. And I'll probably go and grab the Kickstarter and see if it actually goes into this gear here, see if it's actually working real quick. Does it work? Let's find out. Oh yeah. Yeah, it works. 
Jumped off the project for a couple days, and we're back on it. Um, just had some things I had to take care of. I want to talk a little bit about the oil pump. I went ahead and worked on this uh, pump, tried to get it to, to pump, and obviously they didn't delete it because it was in the bike. They just got rid of the oil tank and called it good. Her inners are they're seized so it's probably from years of spinning with no oil and sitting and whatever so over on this end here most people when they delete the pump they get rid of the spinning the pump drive shaft here and they usually on the other side just fasten the delete plate right here now I don't really see the point in deleting the shaft because you never know you might want the pump back and I mean this is what the pump goes on this worm drive here so instead of going and getting that delete plate I just went ahead since the kit I bought for the transmission came with the oil seal I went ahead and changed out the oil seal here so we know she ain't gonna leak I'm gonna put this gear back in service because it doesn't really matter it's not like it's gonna have any parasitic drag or anything but you know maybe someday when I if I keep the bike, I might want to put the oil pump back, and I sure as heck don't want to take this off. I've never really had a problem with oil pumps. This is the first time I've ever had one not work. Personally, I believe it's, uh... Personally, I believe it is due to the... fact that it was running with no actual oil through the service, so... Anyway. That's just my opinion on it. There's no real reason to get a delete plate. This shaft is going to work as a delete plate anyway. And just having it spin there without a pump, that's not going to hurt anything. The $30 tool we made. <laughs> yeah, so we didn't want to buy the original, or excuse me, the generic wrench because it was going to be a two week wait. And I'm not waiting two weeks just to tighten one nut. We're just, we're not doing it. We got too much to do. <laughs> so you know that that's gonna work just fine. Okay. 53 pounds, you know, no, 53.17628 Repidin. Repeating. Tighter than that. That's quite a lot of pounds. There it is, reached it. 53 pounds. Now the clutch is gonna be a whole nother game, but make a new tool for we'll that. worry about that later. Like I said, I ain't waiting two weeks. It's not even the price, it's just waiting that time. I, I've got too many other things to solve on this bike in those two weeks. I wanna be riding it in two weeks. <laughs> Ready for our balancing gear shaft. That's pretty self-explanatory. And we'll have our drive gear right here. That will follow it. I must admit, I'm getting quite excited. Can't wait to play with this thing the right way. This balancer gear is going to be in time with the crank. That's what those little timing marks are all about. So they got to be lined up just right. And obviously, the Woodruff key slot right there needs to be lined up with the Woodruff key on this wheel here in my hand. So it kind of goes without saying, but that's your, that's like your secondary flywheel, so to speak, a balancing shaft. Very nice. Nice and in time. Okay, 58 pounds, 40 pounds. We actually bent the lock washer. For some reason, mine was pretty much flat. I really don't know why. Since they didn't get any further into the engine, I don't even know why they bothered taking this off if they didn't have any intention to get in there. Remember that little string trick I did for the clutch basket? Comes in real handy now. Because not only are they in the right order, but they're facing exactly the way they were facing when they came off. The concave side is supposed to face out this way. It can be hard to tell though sometimes on this one it's not not so easy to tell but yeah I didn't flip anything at all this is exactly how they came off hopefully someone else didn't take them off in the wrong you know <laughs> 
wrong uh, way. Well, they took it off and then flipped it around and then put it back on wrong. Yeah, gotta love that. And this is why my hands are always covered in transmission fluid when I work on this stuff. Because these gloves suck. So, since we were lazy and didn't bother to clean up these parts, and they're covered in transmission fluid, there's no need to pre-lube any of this stuff, because it's plenty lubed. Trust me. Metal's still permeated with oil. I'll just go ahead and slide that into position. Ah! Nicely. Nice to actually show you guys what the spacer underneath the clutch hub looks like. Okay, well, I don't have the clutch wrench holder, as you know, clutch basket holder. And I don't really want to put a chisel in between these teeth and here because that could cause some damage. Something catastrophic could happen. I really don't want to wait for the tool to come in the mail for a couple weeks. So I have to come up with something, and uh, I've seen a lot of people make themselves a temporary disposable wrench out of a piece of wood, usually like a piece of plywood, and they drill out the plywood with this whole pattern, and then they go ahead and bolt it to it. There'll be a hole in the center so they can get the torque wrench on it, and they hold it out here, make themselves a temporary wrench. Seems like a good idea. I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing. I went ahead and put some oil on all of these, some dark oil with clutch material on it, and I pressed this piece of cardboard against that, so that gives me a template right there. So now I'm going to go ahead and make up a mock-up cardboard wrench, and then I will transfer that to a piece of plywood. And uh, we'll just copy the old homemade clutch basket holder plate wrench routine there. So this is our first attempt at this tool took the cardboard, we punched through it into this plywood, and so far the whole pattern lines up pretty good. Hole sawed out the center for the socket, and we're going to go make a couple more because this is some pretty thin material. And then we could go on eBay and sell it as a disposable clutch holding tool. Five bucks. A pop. <laughs> it's a pretty good idea. We'll sell the plans. Yeah, sell the plans so I don't have to ship anything. <laughs> digital cop, digital plan. 3D printable. Alright, so we'll try 20 pounds first just to be gentle with it. See if we can even support 20. We can. This is going to work. Should we jump to 58? <laughs> Go 45 and then 58. Okay. There you go. Don't need your stupid tool. <laughs> yeah. well, that, was, uh, that works really, good. really well. I like that. In hindsight, next time I probably will buy the proper tool, but it's still pretty cool that we were able to make this happen, and I didn't have to wait for anything to show up. Yeah, Just a couple spare pieces of junk laying around, and uh, you know, as far as making a pattern, if you ever have to do this on your bike, you don't need to really measure anything. Just take some of the clutch material and dab it into the basket and that'll penetrate whatever cardboard you use for your template. Pretty simple. You know, there's no real measurement needed. Almost to the clutch pack. I'm going to do the push rod first. I'm a little bit sloppy with the grease. But, you know, Better to have too much than not enough. Except for when that isn't the case, and then, well, then you're just screwed. Put a little ball bearing back in there. Don't forget him. 
Nice. I'm going to go ahead and assemble my clutch pack now. Before I go ahead and skip on, the oblong shape of the steels will actually help you place your notch. So right now my notch is right here. And uh, you'll notice because it's oblong, because of the way that it is, <laughs> because it's oblong, it's only going to go, so like that's where the other one was, right? Well, it's only going to go in so many ways. At least that's what I was noticing with these. So it kind of helps with the spacing a little bit. A lot of my steel tabs were facing in the same direction. They seem to be right around here. So uh, I guess it's a good thing that I'm, you know, having to do this because it's not really right. Finally, we're going to take this little circular guy here and line it up with that circular guy there. Push in that ball bearing as well. Okay, now all I got to do is put the springs, screws back in. I think it's like four and a half or 4.3 pounds or whatever, and just like a crisscross pattern. And then that's it for the clutch pack, back together. Time to say goodbye to our clutch and our workings here. It is a good feeling. Hope I never have to see it again. <laughs> All right, everybody, we got our criss cross torquing pattern with one missing, of course. I never went to the hardware store to replace this yet, um, but I will. I'll get there. We went ahead and got rid of the oil lines that were here in this little boot and plugged them up with some rubber plugs for now. But I'll keep this stuff anyway because, like I said, maybe someday I'll... Spend two hundred dollars on a new pump. Seriously, that's what they're costing. People want about two hundred bucks if you can even find it. <laughs> For now, it'll just sit in a box. There we go. Now I went ahead and left it ugly because no matter how clean she is, she's never going to be pretty. As you can see, somebody went ahead and made the old quick access sport weight reduction perfection beautiful cut work right here. This is supposed to have a guard casted and they just went ahead and you know they improved on it so because of that I left it ugly there's a good chance if I keep this bike I'll be popping this cover back off and putting another one back on that isn't so sports modified so we're on to the part that's my favorite part getting the cylinder down piston on and all that business pretty easy stuff um, only thing is you can see the professionals at the race shop have had their way with RTV a little bit here. Really not supposed to use that. Just supposed to be a gasket there, and that's it. <laughs> I don't know if they were having an air leak or if they were just, you know, obsessive and just didn't want to take a chance. Of course, it doesn't make our job any easier because, you know, we got to do a redneck clean on this, which means, you know, going over it a few times with maybe some alcohol and hoping for the best. Um, to add insult to that injury, I don't have that goofy torque adapter thing for a straight wrench. I don't have that that goes onto your, it's like a weird little um, adapter that you can connect your torque wrench into and then you can turn your, effectively turn your box wrenches into, you know, the ability to torque them. I don't have that. So, um, 
what I will say is these are supposed to be to 18 pounds. So, you know, um, that feels about 18 pounds. Mm, you know what I mean? That's probably what we're going to end up doing, sadly. Um, and I know, it's not going to be, good chance it won't be even torquage. But, uh, you know what? Oh well. <laughs> you know, what I do know is, we, we got a bottle of Lucas here. Um, that's probably not what I'm putting in there, but uh, we, we got a bottle of Lucas, okay? And it's got race flags on it, and, uh, and the American flag, and, and I'm not torquing them, okay? Just leave me alone. <laughs> I'm torquing them to my hand specs, all right? My pre-approved assembly lube. Sure, a little bit of two-stroke oil. Maybe we'll get a little bit on top of the piston too, and maybe it'll leak down over time. <laughs> By the time I get this in place, you just never know. All right, so the important thing is that the arrow faces the exhaust side. And that's about it. That's really the only important thing here, in my opinion. And we know how controversial those are. and slide it on through a little bit of oil should help that go smoothly and it did okay now all I gotta do is walk these one of these pins in on the other side I already got one on this side pretty easy to do especially when they got that little that little bend in the ones without it, I don't like. Those are a pain. This one's much better. I do need to grab my needle noses. Hang on. That'll help make it a little easier. There we go. Bring you all in here real quick. How about that? So I've grabbed the uh, the tab, pulled it. So I slipped the one end without the tab, without the bend, in first. And I kind of pulled the tab, was able to slide it into the channel, and all I gotta do is just send it home there real quick, which you'll hear in a second. There you go. She's in, and just to be sure, I'm gonna grab the tab and just kind of rock it back and forward. Yep, it's in the groove. There we go. Arrow in the right direction. Oil on the piston all over the place. Nice and messy. Next, we put the gasket on, and then uh, we'll slip the cylinder down. Didn't even need a ring compressor because the rings are so dinky. All right, there we are. We're down. Well, there you have it. We are rebuilt. I just got to get her back in the bike. I've got some updates for y'all. Let me remove my breathing protection. Oh, you could take that off for right now. So, I went ahead and got it together, and when I turned it over, the crank went up. The crank started to come back down. It didn't move very far, like your fingernail. I could see it was on the downstroke, though, and it locked. It stopped. I went ahead and popped the flywheel cover off. You could go 99% rotation. You know, 359 degrees, and on that 60th degree, not top dead center, but just past, it would lock. So what was happening, this right here, this area, was bumping against the bell here, in the lower part of the case half. And if you look at the original, 
I wish I would have caught this. Obviously, that's been milled away. So you know what we're doing, right? Well, I'm not going to take this thing back apart, not after all the amount of work I have into it. But it turns out this cheap little, it's not even a Dremel, this little drill master is enough to mine that away. So I'll be at this for a little while. We're going to fix this. Um, so to anybody who buys a Kalama connecting rod, take a measurement around here and make sure that, you know, that it's going to not collide because the tolerances are actually that tight. You would not believe it, but I mean, I'd believe it. I should have caught that. So yeah, if you're buying a Kalama crank, you might have to do a little bit of milling before you get her in there. I think this will work. I think I can save this without popping the rest of the engine down. We've gone from the race shop professionals to the machine shop professionals. Yep. Right in between there. And it's there. catching right there. And it's just missing second. now. Yeah. This is exactly there. what they did to that one. That's what they did. And ours doesn't look pretty, but it looks pretty good for a cheap, 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 cheap cool. job. Yeah, for a save your ass job. Yeah, because I, I didn't want to take this back apart. I really did not. So uh, that, that's just unreal. We're gonna go ahead and put the put the cylinder back on top and turn it over and see what it does. Crisis averted. My God, stress level reduced. All right. So before we go ahead and finagle that engine into the frame. I thought it'd be a good idea to replace on these, since I don't have them. <laughs> this was uh, not the cheapest kit. They're 3D printed as well, so I don't know how good the quality will be on that, but uh, we'll give it a try. I didn't really need one of these, but it came with it, so. And I got two of these. Even got some hardware. We went ahead and got ourselves some crap and built the safest jack stand known to man. That thing will survive an earthquake. <laughs> and uh, now we can actually work on this area here. Looks like I'm going to have to slip this off. And then I'll have to go ahead and probably pack some grease around this guy and stick it on and that should be good enough I guess. My goodness man. All you had to do was buy a couple little rollers to avoid such damage. That is just, uh, well, it's just perfect. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, how the hell is a guy going to get the frame back together, Mr. Clever? Well, thank God for ratchet straps. A little bit of help from the crowbar. A little bit of help from the ratchet strap. Got the bolt back in there. So obviously I'm going to go on the other side and get that drumstick back in on the other side. And then we can finally start working on the engine. Got my rollers in. All three of them replaced. I'm not real happy with what I bolted them to, but that's part of the frame, so... It's just that easy. Sure. Never mind the stuff you guys didn't see, though. <laughs> Uh, we don't talk about that. At this point, I basically am never going to make my money back on this bike if I even choose to sell it. But if she's a good runner, we're going to go back through and clean up some of this stuff, make some improvements, put the right stuff in, not UPC freaking hose clamps and stuff. But for now, it'll work. Probably even get an actual Makuni even though they're hard to find sometimes, you know, depending on if you're trying to get an original one or just upgrading to a modern one, whatever. But uh, yeah, this, this bike has such a level of a-hole all around it, and we have to reduce the a-hole. 
we have to reduce the a-hole amount. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with stuff like that. We'll probably replace on this because that's busted down there. You know, slowly make this into a nice machine. Put more money into it than it's ever going to be worth, of course. But uh, just that way, if I'm stuck with it, at least it's a bearable thing to ride. Right now, she's just got to prove to me that she wants to run. Yeah, Yamalube. We're going to go to 650 milliliters and no more and no less. No more, no less. Just sounds cool. Sounds witty. I went on and removed the shrink wrap here on the kill switch. And, uh, yeah, you know, that might be why the kill switch doesn't work. Because, you know, when you don't have the wire end, you just, just shove it in there and it's just as good, right? Shrink wrap it, it'll work. Sure. <sighs> anyway. Got everything tightened up. Got this old tired chain and sprocket back together. Really like the uh, hook wear there. But, you know, before we go ahead and buy on a new chain and sprocket setup, let's just see if the damn thing runs, right? Well, we're all gassed up. We know we have spark. I confirm that yes, the kill switch does not work because of this purple wire. It needs to be properly secured, which is pretty obvious. All that's left to really do is kick her over, see what she does. She might also loosen up. That didn't sound too bad. It does sound a little bit barren-y, but you know, we'll give them a couple minutes of run time. They should quiet up. How about that? Didn't see any smoke. Hardly any at all. Fired right up in just a couple kicks. It's probably going to take a little while for those bearings to fly it up. Here's another. 